This is a, this is a goldfish. I I'd, uh, found recently, I'm very fond of it because I thought to myself, we don't come back as a NBA power forward next life, I'd be a goldfish. So I don't have to remember anything. But this one uh, is, is actually a pencil sharpener. <laughs> and I don't have the heart to use it. So I have to, because it's so violent, you know? So I give it to you. Oh, thank you. It's my it's, gift. I thought maybe it was your lucky lecture thing. OK. Well, I think I, I've been so busy because I've been trying to curate this huge show in Sunset Park in which uh, Lisa and Matt Gray, Livenstein, her husband, terrific painter, are both, and some of you probably in here, maybe, yeah. Hey, Jeff. And uh, so I haven't thought much at all what I'm going to do, but on the way here, by the way, it's going to open this Sunday. It's called Come Together, the Vibrant Sandy Year One. Why Year One? Because the one that left out won't beat me up, because there was year two, year three. But it's nice to have 50% of artists who were sending victims. Uh, come together with those who was not affected. It's, the key word is so, solidarity. The key word. So I hope you can come. Uh, so this is what I want to read to you because I want to train here. I was reading and I was laughing out loud. And there's no one in the art world who make me laugh like the way Lisa can. Uh, it's amazing. I read to you briefly and I tell you why I'm doing this. What are you reading from? From the transcript of the rail. You oh, came and paid The unedited visit. transcript? Well, yes. And it's about 19,000 words. But I read you <laughs> one very short segment. Rail, who's me. Anyway, Lisa, you are here at the rail headquarters at 640. And it's Saturday, February 12, 2009. Just gave it. No, it's 14. It's Valentine's Day, Fong. It's Valentine's Day, obviously. Rail, 14th? Oh, just gave it. Do you have a sweetheart? You did not get her any flowers? Rail, I just met her a year ago. <laughs> just gave it. Oh, you are in trouble. <laughs> Rail, I'm always in trouble, Lisa, but I don't care because I don't like to go along with what everyone else would do. You know, the conventional tie that goes up and down so politely. Just gave it, you know? Funny enough, a long time, a long ago, Valentine's Day is how I got into a lot of this work. Because my husband is from Soviet Union. And I used to say, oh, you never get me anything for Valentine's Day. And he's like, I'm from Soviet Union. I don't understand. <laughs> Real. That's what I say. I'm from Vietnam. <laughs> Just gave it. He's like, oh, don't get it. I don't get it. Well, just do it the way you know. Real. Did, did he get on with it? Just gave it. No, he kept forgetting. Real. Good, me too. <laughs> just gave it. She say, how about it? I'm just really nice to you and love you every day of the year, meaning Matt very saying to Lisa. And I'm like, oh, but I still want flowers. <laughs> then I got over it. Well, you gobble it good, just gave it well. What I started to do is to make fun of myself in paintings. And that's sort of how I ended up doing a lot of these early paintings that was called Heaven. Uh, they tit, were tit just heaven. like tits heaven. Not tits, tit. Tit, tit heaven. <laughs> uh, they were just like, they were just like this tits. You say tits in here? Wrong transcription. <laughs> Uncor uh, uncorrected. All right. They were just like this. They were suffocating someone with flowers. Like you want some flower, bitch. <laughs> like making fun of myself. I move on. That's sort of the way I cure most of my problem. I use painting, I paint myself out of the problem. Today he say, do you want some flowers? I'm like, no. <laughs> He's like, no, really? I can get them. She say, forget about it. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's Lisa. I mean, how, how can I rephrase it? 
There are endless moments of that sort, very memorable ones, but I can tell you a few. Well, I think one point where Lisa was telling me how she had to give up painting uh, for trying too hard to make likable Wurme object. She gave up painting uh, because she was saying that she had some weird notion or relationship with what painting was to her. In, the, in other words, painting was on top and she was the bottom and she didn't like it. She was very angry. I mean, she wanted to be on top, beat it down. She wanted to take control with it. And I say, well, but isn't that what most serious painters do? Uh, they aspire to reach their maturity. And then Lisa say, well, I'm very happy to be in touch with my anger. Uh, but and then I have to deal with other issue because if you're in touch with anger, you can be like serial killers who's in touch with the anger too, which is an interesting remark because it reminded me of uh, Denise Diderot who once said that artists and criminals are alike because they both defy rules. But what different between artists do and what criminals do is that artists know how to control his or her own impulses. That was interesting. But and then again, it's about humor. That's where the love is. And I think the best thing for me in that interview, I'm not, I don't have ranking, it just depends what day I'm feeling a certain thing. Uh, reading that today, you say that um, you're happy to invest your aggression because you discover painting is a limitless, more complex layers uh, medium in which anger, aggression, as well as a sense of love for art. And you invest them, the two together, in interesting, this is interesting, in color, in form, and in composition. I think that's a three distinct elements in Lisa. Uh, let's not talk too much, I'm talking too much. Why don't no, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying, to, I'm actually, I think it's more interesting to look at something besides the swooshy thing, and I don't know how to do it. Because I'm old school, I'm a slide person, and this whole business of... Okay, oh, yeah. so, um, so because um, Fong was doing the uh, show, he's, I expected that he wasn't going to look at any of this. Um, I decided that one of the the ways, the images that we're starting with, and we're not going to talk about everything, because what I think is more interesting is to sort of talk about something more general and broader, and really open it up to the audience. And I had this idea, we have an extra seat or two for dinner, so anybody we, who we all decide has the best question <laughs> uh, will win dinner that the students cook. So this might get you going in terms of getting past, you know, if you're hungry, you don't have a plan. Or you, you could also win and choose not to do it. You know, that's the other thing. But anyway, so um, I started the slide lecture with when my work started to be photographed digitally. Um, because this whole thing with uh, computers and digital technology all of my work, I mean, I, I, you know, these, these conversations that we have in these situations, one thing, it's like I can't stand the way most of my work looks during these PowerPoint things and because it's uh, the translation doesn't work. So just to say why I don't have earlier work or why I don't have work from the things that Fong is referring to, the tit heaven things, we're working on that, you know, because these things have to be drums. It's all big project, but anyway, so I just thought, well, you know, let's just use the images that look halfway decent already because they're started with a computerized thing. So in whatever year this was, um, maybe this is six years ago, I remember when I had this work shot digitally and then I kept saying, well, I still need slides and four by fives and then they gave me slides and they looked terrible and I said, these look terrible, I don't understand. They said, well, they were transferred from digital. And I was like slowly trying to understand that this is, I mean, that's the thing about being a painter is that you're sort of stuck 
in a certain kind of time warp anyway. So anyway, if you had um, hoped to see some earlier images, I apologize, but um, this is why we're start starting here, because this is the first, this uh, painting is one of the pie face paintings. Um, why pie face? Why pie face? Yeah, what attraction? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it, I got to the pie faces uh, through some very weird circuitous route. Um, what I find, I was in Rome, Matt Vey, my husband is a painter and won the Rome Prize. Um, I, just because for the students in here, or people who have re been rejected, I applied for the Rome Prize like six times and was rejected. Then I was asked to be on the jury. <laughs> and, then, and then I got to go because my husband won the first time he applied. As what's called a fellow traveler, and a fellow traveler, I am not because he is not, you know, a communist. <laughs> He's anti-communist. So we, we had this sort of funny experience of being in Rome and I was there and I got like, I was just sort of left to my own devices and somebody had asked me to make a porno movie, not to star in one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> although this is probably <laughs> what would have happened. But I, I, I said, that, you know, I'm not a filmmaker. I don't think that would be interesting. And then when I was in Rome, I started to watch these movies on Italian TV, trying to learn Italian. And they, one thing led to another, and I started to kind of become interested in slapstick. And because a slapstick is, is such an Italian, perfect Italian form. Mm -hmm. And there were these films that were on every night called Comitia, Comedia Orotica Italiana. Mm -hmm. and, and I own a bunch of them now. It's like not easy to find them. And you know, in Italy, they wouldn't sell them to you. They're like, why would you want to buy that? That's trash. You know, they would sell you, you know, something important, but not, you know, in film stores. But we were sort of turned away. I had to come back to America and go on eBay, find it. But anyway, there were these, it was always like a, a short, funny looking guy, a good looking doctor with tweed suit, a beautiful naked woman and some sort of an espresso. And it was a crazy situation. I thought, well, you know, I could sort of imagine doing something like that. And then anyway, it, it, felt, it all fell apart, but in my, in my, in my, curiosity of thinking about maybe doing it, and thank God I didn't, because I'd still be stuck with this thing that I would have made. Um, I had the idea that the last scene would be somebody sort of plop, sitting in a pie, and it would be just sort of uh, random. Somebody knew Buck Henry, the, the comedian, and he said that he would do it. He would be the, the guy who would sit in the pie with, and I, I pictured him with a pair of shoes and socks naked, just kind of very, you know, uh, unattractively nude plop in a pie, and it would be sort of an anti sort of sex scene. Anyway, um, fortunately, I didn't do it, and I was doing a bunch of research, called, you know, on like pieing, <laughs> <laughs> and and then somebody threw a shoe at the president, and mm -hmm. there was this, and then there was like all things about like people throwing things at people, and it's just started to like, my mind started to percolate about, you know, that kind of aggression towards an image. Right. And um, I guess, you know, I guess I, I, I sort of for, took, took what I had been looking at and I found somebody online called Chrissy LaCreme, <laughs> who is a man, but is a trans, what was it called when you're married but you dress as a woman? Trans, transgender? not transgender, no, 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 no. Just not transvestite, but you just, tr no? Cross-dresser, cross-dresser. Cross -dresser. Cross -dresser. So Chrissy Lee Cram was a cross-dresser, but was really into, was really into, um, uh, um, TV anchor people. It was very, very specific. And then his wife would always, like, so he'd be sort of dressed up, and then he'd be like, the pie would be, and then, you know, it was this, this is what the hot sex thing in that family was. Like, he'd be like, at the end, he'd go, you know, and they'd have these photographs, and his website's over. I mean, I keep looking for it, it's down, maybe it'll come back up again. But anyway, he was this sort of like chubby kind of 
guy with a chubby wife down in Atlanta, and they would just pie each other. And I, and I just kind of fell in love with this uh, yeah. image of the, the last scene, because they, they shot every scene. And mm -hmm. there was something about it that seemed like, um, you know, what, what it's like to put yourself out there. You know, mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, you kind of have to be willing to take it, take it in the face. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the other thing I think that we talked about in the real interview is that um, I was also, also when I was in Rome, looking, thinking about um, mar all the martyrdom that you are constantly thinking about. Yeah, move forward, keep doing, enter be entertaining, move the images. So um, move, keep moving them. Well, this one's cool. This one's cool. Um, that's like the uh, anchor person suit, you know, kind of chumpy, chubby anger person suit. But the, the, the Chrissy uh, element was one thing, but then I was thinking about um, in Rome and sort of in all these paintings how uh, martyrdom uh, was, was depicted and then randomly on, uh, because in Rome they didn't, um, they televised uh, what was the, the de beheading of uh, Nicholas Berg. Um, you actually could see it in Rome for like a few seconds because the, you know, it wasn't like mm -hmm. American television. And there was this gesture, I think his name was Bert, mm -hmm. if I'm wrong, I'm, you know. But this, oh, yeah. this painting, this particular gesture of, of kind of like being tickled, that was something that I saw when he had, they put the knife to his neck. Mm -hmm. And I just remember being so completely freaked out by that because I had been looking at paintings, you know, by Caravaggio or, or whoever, and these bloody scenes of, of, of just murder. And, you know, in, 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 the, in the French church in Rome, there's a, a, a painting of, um, uh, the, there's, a, it's a, there's a triptych there, and it's a St. Matthew triptych. The version of St. Matthew. Well, one is the conversion, and one is where he's writing the scriptures, and then the last one is his murder. Yeah. And it's a crazy scene of, like, chaos. And I remember thinking when I was looking at that painting, you know, like, well, thank God that sort of stuff doesn't happen anymore. You know, and then you go home, and it's on TV, and then you're like, wait a minute. We, it's like, it's, it's like, it's not like here, but it's here. Mm -hmm. And w these are the kind of things that, you know, were sort of just rolling around in my head that, Kind of led to some of these things, so that's probably you know not a very satisfying answer. But well, I think that uh, the the pie in, um, it's more than just uh, the face getting pie on. To me, it's, it evoked the, the some kind of formal device. Uh, it, it holds the image. Like I remember talking to Ron Warchop about John Graham who paint cross-eyed woman, you remember? Imagine if, if Bellini's, the actress's son, Teresa, without the eyes crossed. It wouldn't be so interested. So to me, it's a spatial trapping device, and I think that's how I see it, a certain kind of asymmetrical that go along with it too. For instance, this one, I never see such an external oblique expand and contract like that twist uh, above the pelvis and with such gluteus, meteus, or maximus, wherever that, <laughs> that turn so voluptuous, the asymmetrical tits. Is that what you call it, Lisa? Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, um, don't what, get distracted. What do, you, what do you call it, Fong? Uh, 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 breast <laughs> apple. Apple breast? Breast apple? My Shapiro tell, remember? Okay. The Cezanne apple? Uh, I think that that becomes a little more than just a sustainable uh, image to me, and I think that's how I see in those pine faces. Pine faces is a trapping device. And notice also the centralization of the image, how she twitched with it, left, right, a little bit off the axis, sometimes right in the middle for a certain reason. Uh, and the color. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about color? Why you have such a unique sense of color, they're not quite contemporary, and yet they're very contemporary. Well, I mean, it's just, you know, something that's always mattered to me. Uh, who knows, you know? 
maybe I was just born to do it or born to think about it. You know, I kind of remember being in art school. I don't, are there, everyone here seems like they're my age or older, but it's like, are there any students from the school here still? Okay, good. All right. So I, I, I wanted to uh, address the students because, you know, that's what, you know, we're doing. Um, I just remember being in, like, painting one class and the, the discussion of color uh, came up and I don't know, there, there, there was this kind of like immediate uh, visceral reaction that I had to sort of running with the, the material and like kind of like understanding it in a way that was a little bit outside of even what was being taught. You know, I kind of started to like, you know, when I, growing up, my father was a truck driver and you know, he's retired now, he's still alive. But um, I would sneak off to the Philadelphia Art Museum on the subway and go look at paintings at the, at the museum, which is, you know, a nice thing if you're, you know, not a kid who has access to art, but you live in a city like that, you can just kind of go and, and look at it. And like when I go and do talks at places where there's like these, there's just no art, you know, I just don't know how the kids can actually connect because I actually do believe when I sort of went back when I had my first museum show in Philadelphia, <clears throat> and I was hanging the paintings at the ICA, and then I would sort of pop over to the museums, the other museums, I realized, oh my God, I'm so um, influenced by looking at this color. Um, you know, because Philadelphia had such a rich tradition of French painting, um, mm -hmm. and they are so smart with color. I mean, as, as opposed to um, looking at this smart tradition of uh, uh, Spanish painting, which is a different kind of color. At any rate, so should we start with questions? No, I want to talk about <laughs> I was the some, socks. You want to talk about the socks? The socks, yeah. As the opposed socks. to anything else in that painting? <laughs> no, it's just a full, I mean. What do you call that song? Uh, Viagra? You know what's so funny is it's, I was, okay? a, I, was at the, I was at, I was at the MoMA once. And I was standing in front, it was the old MoMA, and I was standing in front of um, uh, a painting, and a man came up to me and, and, and said to me, what do you call that? And you know, he was like pretending to write a paper. And I was like, oh, you know, that's a flower. And he, and he keeps pointing, and then he points to the vagina. He says, what do you call that? And I was like, oh, great, I'm being molested at MoMA. You know, it was just like, <laughs> I, was, I realized I got tricked. But anyways, it was like, I was like, ha ha, how many times a day do you do this? Joke. No, but in we, a way, in a way, it's 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 that exposed cubit area that that encouraged you to look elsewhere. And I think <laughs> that the thing that Lisa's trick is really it's very she's very amazingly uh, thoughtful how to distribute where the eye travel. And I think one of the things that I'm also am interested in Lisa formation the last five or six years longer even, is the play of, of pun. If there is a certain kind of uh, place in the canvas where you can identify a certain composition revise, you can call, call it, it will pick up somewhere else, a certain kind of curvy linear or rectilinear, diagonal, or how it is play off the center. That is the most interesting thing, which when you ask me what I call that, I answer by Agra. Why? I don't know. <laughs> but it, it, I thought, well, maybe the people who invented it was probably combined vagina and Niagara Fall. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Very powerful two things coming together. Well, I, I think that the fact that there's a, ba a baby in this painting is probably something that bothered a lot of people because you don't want to see, mm -hmm. even though, I mean, I've been to, I've never had a child, but I asked a friend if I could come and see her give birth. And it is, you know, clearly there's a vagina with a baby at the same time. But if you do it this, if you put it this way, it seems so wrong. And, you know, I find, that the that it that was sort of I'm trying I guess the baby had already been yeah I already done that when I right. made this painting and I purposely made this uh, figure in the foreground clearly not mm -hmm. having just 
put out a baby. And it was so much about uh, putting things together in um, a way, there's a, uh, there's a painting, I don't have the reproduction of it and I've talked about it before, Something that is a guiding principle for me in, in, in art making is this painting that I saw when I was a student. Uh, I went to Tyler, and um, the reason why I went to Tyler is because it was a state school, and I lived in Philadelphia, my parents said, well, that's the one we can afford. And I was like, ugh. And then I heard that they had a third year in Rome, and my parents said, well, we can't afford it, but I said, I'm going. I'm going to do whatever I have to do. I, so I did a whole lot of stuff like nude modeling and so I you know I know what it's like to you know be the depict depicted um, and it was just whatever I had to do to sort of make money to go to Rome and one of the things that I saw when I was in Rome we had this art history teacher that was sort of relentless and she loved she just loved what she did and we, she took us to in Venice after hours she she took us to the church of San Zachariah and um, there's a painting by Bellini in there that was originally um, made to uh, mimic the church. And um, later it was taken away by Napoleon and it's been put back. So if you're in Venice, you should definitely check this place out. But it's a painting of Madonna and Child and four saints. And the thing that was amazing to me about that painting um, is that it I'm gonna see if I can find something that might, like something like this actually be, be a little bit more telling about it. But um, it, what I loved about the painting was that the, 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 no one was looking, or there was no narrative. The painting was called a sacred conversation painting. And it seemed to me like one of the most important things that I'd ever seen because there was no uh, narrative like a crucifixion or a deposition and it didn't tell a story. What it was is it was a complete sense of mood. It seemed like it was a scene of life after death because each of the saints um, were from different eras and uh, spoke different languages, but they were all um, put in this room with, with the baby Jesus and the Madonna. And, that's, and you realized also when you look at the painting that these people were right before the instant, if, if this is heaven or this is mm -hmm purgatory or wherever they are standing around um, that they were in excruciating pain just before they were in this scene and there's this incredible sense of peace in this painting that um, I'm describing I'm sorry I don't have a reproduction of it but um, it is one of the things about it is that the fact that there's this kind of disconnect between um, images and then there's another painting in Venice which is uh, probably even more famous and come to you as The Tempest um, by, um, oh my God, two glasses of wine, now I'm starting to forget that. <laughs> Giorgione, thank you. <laughs> One time I was teaching, I couldn't remember Matisse's name. I was like, yeah, really famous because of an M. <laughs> um, anyway, but uh, so Giorgione's Tempest is the same thing where you have the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the baby being suckled by this nude woman and there is a you know, a, a guard or some, some sort of Venetian looking man and there's a storm coming and you can't really put together why any of them are there or what's the point of it. Let's, just, let's go forward. Yeah, but I want to make a comment about oh. this and we can go forward. Okay. <laughs> you notice how on the left is soft, very infused edges because it's shown the light on, whereas on the right is strongly delineated to the point where it almost appears like a cutout. These are the kind of things that make me excited about Lisa's work. By the way, the pelvis come down at a sharp angle, almost like a vase, so that came forward. So it, it go against the tonal, the volume of the form. And same thing can be said about that interval between her right leg uh, sorry, Lisa, I had to point that well, out. Well, you, you asked about the stockings, and, you know, because today I was deciding to put a stocking into, a striped stocking into a painting yet again. And um, I sort of hit upon it because for everything I would probably decide to do, I decide to do because uh, there's some sort of art historical reason for it and then some sort of pop reason for it or two or 
uh, some sort of personal reason. And uh, you know, in in this source material that I'll come across, they often will use striped stockings. Um, you know, in the kind of soft core kind of stuff you find on the internet or here or there. You know, it's a kind of a thing. But then also I realized like in Dr. Seuss, there's, you know, the, that sort of striped cat in the hat mm -hmm. thing. And there's this kind of funny use of the sort of striping. And then also, you know, the witch in, in, in the Wizard of Oz, you know, when they, the house falls on her and they're like, she's got these funny, before she disappears, got these funny striped socks. And it's just sort of like, I, I, I guess I sort of will say that I like, I'll sort of sense that there's all these things that will connect. And, you know, obviously, like, there's just different places that these things will kind of pop up and come together. So, you know, it, it just, you know, and also it just ultimately feels right. You know, it's like 90% of what I do during the day when I'm painting is putting something in and taking it out. Mm -hmm. I put it in, take it out, put it in, take it out, put it in, take it out. And um, the small paintings, um, you know, that, that can happen a lot, but it, it, it's, you know, maybe I'll do like two or three versions rather than sort of taking this particular small painting. I, I, I labored over quite a bit, and it was kind of an interesting painting for me because the, 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 you can see that it's two small canvases, and I think they're about this big. And the, the one on the left, I, I paint it and repaint it and repaint it and repaint it. And it's funny because I took little iPhone pictures of them as it was going. And le lately I've come across them and I'm like, that looked pretty good. What'd you, <laughs> what'd you paint over that for? And, but I was, there were things that I, there was something that I needed to get to. And in that painting, it was the pairing of that dress that's made up of, um, flicks of paint you know, against the stripe. So it's like the dot versus against the stripe. Mm -hmm. And um, when I sort of was working on that paint, I mean, it's like I really lay, I, I would say that I don't tend to labor over the small ones, but that one on the left, I like just kept scraping down and starting over, scraping down. There was a, at one time there was a baby between the legs of the woman uh, whose legs are spread which is how her legs got like that. And there's something about that gesture that's very vulgar, which I like. I, I sort of like vulgarity in painting because it kind of keeps it less, um, uh, it, it keeps it, um, it's very important, like what Fong said earlier, the idea of the top bottom thing. It's, it's that I've had, um, in order for me to work, I can't feel, I mean, you know, the incredible pressure and awareness of how incredibly much any of us sucks. You know, the best painter alive today is so horrible compared to, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of skill or whatever. So that's like, you have to set that aside. You have to put that completely out of your mind and you just have to take it on in some sort of other term. You have to create new terms. And um, so the, the sort of sense of, when I was at Yale, I didn't, include the person that I had been prior to being an artist. I mean, I think, I remember the day that I, I went into art school, I walked into art school and met my first artist. Um, I've been thinking about it recently because of a different conversation I had with my mother. Um, was really like a major turning point in my life. Like, I, I love artists. You know, I was like, I don't want, I can't, I, you know, it's like I can't believe that, you know, I'd been on this submarine for years as a child without knowing any. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is that, you know, you go to museums and you look at these paintings and it's the closest you get is to have these sort of seances with artists that you are looking at um, and saying like, you know, like, how do I get there? How do I get there? But to meet other living, breathing artists and then all of us are having this problem of how do we make something that is worth it, you know, mm -hmm. worth bothering to, you know, like all this paint and canvas and time and energy, like, I mean, you know, it's an amusing way to spend your time, but what makes it worthwhile, you know, became a question. And when I was at Yale, I was like, um, you know, the, re the, the, the heavy burden of history was laid, I, I took it on probably a lot more than most people, 
but um, you know, the way out of it for me was to just literally say fuck it. And not just anything, but seriously fuck it. Mm -hmm. Those words and the, and the vulgarity of that, and that freed me. And so that in a sense, like gestures like that, that end up in the paintings are necessary for my um, ability to think and breathe mm -hmm. and access, I mean, I think there's something about being able to access the, your highest intelligence um, at any given time. And you, 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 do, you, you frame of state of mind is extremely important, and this is for the students and other painters. I, I, I wouldn't tell other painters how to do it, but for students who are still searching, I think you have to really, really figure out a, 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 a frame of mind that you make your best art in. And um, just really trust that, even if everyone tells you that it's the wrong way to go. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, um, when I, on a different note, when I finished this left side, I went ahead and started a big canvas of it. And I had this really weird thought as the painting was almost finished, and, and, and I've never had this happen, but a, a, a curator actually saw it and like really liked it. And I was like, it's not finished. And then they're like, oh, it's OK, it's OK. And I think they thought I was going to do a couple more things. And um, this is the large painting for this. Uh, maybe I can go ahead and find it. This is mm -hmm. it. Um, I went ahead and made the, the, the left panel because that's what I thought I was doing. And I ordered a second canvas to go to the right and attached it to the right. And like <laughs> Matt, my husband said, are you trying to screw this up? <laughs> it's like, it's not very often that somebody of that sort will come to my studio and say, oh, I love this painting and you know we're gonna get it. And then I was like, I just doubled the size of it, not because I'm trying to be an asshole, but mm -hmm. it really struck me that this idea of almost like a, it just opened itself up. And, and I thought, like, this is like so um, non Western in some weird way. Like, who throws another canvas on halfway <laughs> through a painting or more than halfway through a painting? Um, it worked out okay in the end um, because you know basically if you just don't charge that much more you're fine you know mm -hmm. just say okay well I'll, you know another 20 bucks you can have the other right side mm -hmm. um, <laughs> my bad you know I didn't mean to make it double the size so it, it became this thing where I began to question why am I doing this why am I doing this thing because I have done and then I realized you know who's done this before me yeah. I've done this painting I don't have the image of because it's pre digital photography right, is one, Good Evening Ham Ass is a painting I made where I, start, I started a painting and then midway through I threw another canvas to the, to the left of it and it's a diptych. And um, I'm, I'm planning on doing a show um, of paintings that I've made for the past 20 years and I think most people don't even realize it and it wasn't until I actually it came to me in my sleep that I've always done diptychs and triptychs, but for different reasons. Some reasons were these, uh, you know, just kind of throwing a canvas to the to the left or to the right of a painting. I've also done paintings like this blonde brunette and redhead, and my last show at Zorner. Can I go ahead just to show the the last painting at Zorner? Sure. That this one, um, this triptych, um, which was made to be a triptych, but. Also, with this one, I started the painting with the painting on the left and hadn't planned to do the other two in advance and just listened to my intuition and developed a canvas and um, the image around it. And it's a rather um, intuitive way to work, mm -hmm. um, especially on such a large scale. But for some reason, it sort of really worked for me. So you wanted to say something about yeah. that? Yeah. No, just that. Uh just like not that dissimilar with the pie face in a way, which encourage you to look elsewhere. So you have this uh, very strong deck, I mean triangle, which is the mountain. And then on the left, you have the gingerly touching feet of the girl there, which is instable. And then you repeat the form of the ankles, 
of the girl on the left and the extended legs with the funny shape on it, like a nose. Uh, these are kind of things that I find it interesting because once we spoke about Morandi, uh, Giorgio Morandi and someone approached Morandi and said, why do you paint bottles? And he answered that, well, I, I only paint between the bottles. <laughs> and then it, that's how we first met when you were in Rome with Marte because we did the tribute to Guston. Oh. And you wrote a that's right. paragraph about Guston um, in a way consuming both Morandi, uh, interesting in that Morandi we noticed that, I had the privilege actually in 87, my first trip to Italy on the traveling fellowship, I will manage, I was able to call up his sister who took me and showed the studio and I noticed that how the still light was set up at eye level because they were, you were able to rise, raise up the still light, so that's how he painted. Therefore the form become monumental. And I think there's something of that still life uh, set up in Lisa's work where it allows her to play with monumentality, trying to justify a certain kind of imaginative distances and frontal, and it's all happened in the most nonsensical way, but it makes sense. Well, I've always liked how in certain uh, paintings, uh, Mirandi and, and Gustin took it from Mirandi, but then I think they all took it from, you know, different people in, in the Renaissance where it's just like this ledge is the paint, the beginning of the painting is like a ledge and then something occurs over the ledge um, and it's like, you know, makes you question as a viewer, okay, where am I? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and these kind of things kind of have kind of always remained somewhat interesting and true um, to something that I was thinking about. Right. Anyway, so this, this little teeny painting is something that I sort of scratched off um, and then made that, um, oops, oops, wow, not good at that. Okay, and then made the painting on the left and then it, I said, oh no, here I go again. I have this instinct that I should, this painting goes on almost like unrolling a scroll and I was just thinking, what's the matter with you? And then, well, maybe it's not a bad thing. Maybe I should just, ex I should exhort, uh, you know, embrace it as a good thing. So when I got, I had <coughs> ordered two extra canvases in case I made, you know, I thought it was going to be a diptych, and and then it ended up moving and keep it kept going. And I have these little snapshots of like how it would have been, you know, like if this had been over here. I kept playing with all the arrangements, like. And it was just this kind of perfect thing from how it all worked out, which is that the tripartite structure of the painting on every level, um, from the fact that it is the three canvases, but also the three uh, groupings, mm -hmm. um, and also that the groupings are so different in their psychological tone. Um, the uh, figure in the foreground, uh, which very sweetly, uh, a little boy that is in my life and he's not told that he can't look at my work. He was really upset that a friend's kid, that he couldn't come to the opening because his parents didn't want to just yeah. have him at the opening and then he wanted to come see the show so I went and got him and took him <laughs> to see the show. And we walked around the show and he looked at this, he has a little sister, um, who had just been born and he said, he just looked at this painting and he said, wipe from front to back. You know, it was like for him, it looked like a baby di being diapered. And it just never occurred to me that that's what like in some way, like, but that was like his point of view was like he didn't look at it as pornography or as like some sort of weird vagina thing. He just looked at it as like a kind of an innocent thing. Um, but, the, but, the, but the figure in the foreground is, is you know, sort of like, all id in a sense. It does. Yeah. She, she doesn't even need to have a head. It was there was a head in the figure when I started, but I took it out. And the the figure on the left, uh, well, the figure in the the figures, the grouping in the background, um, this kind of uh, Matt they will call them called them nazias, uh, which in Russian we, we on our honeymoon. <laughs> 
sorry to always bring Matt Fay up, but you know, he, we've, been, we've been doing this art thing for 30 some years, so sort of like those of you who have couples or you know, just like always there. We went, uh, it was not really a honeymoon because it was still sort of the Soviet Union, so it was like more of a trip. Um, there was no, um, I was like, where is the umbrella in the drink? <laughs> um, but anyway, so we went to Russia and we went to Moscow and it was pretty rough, rough going. And I would, went into the museums and these old ladies kept coming up to me and like no matter what I did, like I'd just be standing there, like I was the only one with like shiny white teeth anywhere to be seen. So I like just stood out like a, like a bulb, you know, and like they just knew I was an American because they weren't used to seeing Americans. And Matthew is constantly going, shh, lower your voice. And I was like, hi, this is really great, you know, hey, it's so great. So, um, and he still was paranoid because of, you know, he, you know, you never thought he was going to get to go back to the Soviet Union. Anyway, so these old ladies kept coming up to me, me in particular, and they kept saying to me, Nizya. Yeah. And I don't speak Russian. And I said to him, what's that? And he said, they, he, he said, don't. I said, don't what? And he goes, whatever it is you're thinking about doing, just don't. <laughs> and that sort of stayed in my head. And I realized that all my life, there's always been this character, a group of characters, whether it's, you know, it is just people just putting their hand on their hip and saying to me, whether it's my work or me, just don't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess the response is, you know, something of this sort. But the, 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 the um, <laughs> I'll put you in my painting and uh, raise you 10. But anyway, so this, these, these characters in the background is kind of like from another time. I also like the idea that in a painting, you can have like a contemporary life, uh, something so obviously of our moment, something of like almost out of the 19th century from a different land. And that goes back to the sacred conversation thing where it's like all these things kind of are always swirling around because in, in, a, in a person, we are all we are so many things at the same time. I mean, your past, your present, and in some people who are very heightened in their awareness, mm -hmm. whether they realize it or not, their future is kind of something that kind of glimpses their desires, um, their the lows that they have, the things they wish they weren't thinking about, you know, their 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 uh, their high selves, their low selves. There's this idea of something called standing in the spaces. There's a psychoanalyst, um, his name's I'm forgetting, he's English, and he, he, he wrote a book called Standing in the Spaces. And it's this sort of new idea in, in psychoanalysis, which is not the id, the ego, and the superego, um, you know, these three things. It's that, that each individual is comprised of many, 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 many characters, mm -hmm. and that they, if you are quote unquote healthy, you, they, they can speak and they can communicate. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess in the example of, of, of someone with a multiple personality disorder like that movie, um, yeah. Sybil, Sybil, Sybil yeah. um, that was, you know, trauma would make the personalities not speak at all. So in each, it's, it's sort of apparently the new idea in psychoanalysis is that, and I find it fascinating when you go back to the idea of, um, what's possible in a painting and um, well here's like your you know uh, the the idea that there can be multiple readings I think so what you're saying is like that you know you can be um, working between lots and lots of realities uh, both high, I mean obviously the high and the low and everything in between um, uh, you know, and just different experiences that you've had, some of which you wish you hadn't, but they're there and they show up in the pictures. Um, I haven't had this experience um, personally, but <laughs> um, you know, it somehow seems very familiar to me. You know, it's, I, you won't believe this, but this, there's a, the smallest Rembrandt etching influence this painting. Uh, it's a pain. It's a little tiny etching of Rembrandt. Um, it was like a goldsmith, and he's smithing. A, 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 you can tell from the etch. I mean, the thing is so small. It's incredible. Um, I have a book where it's like Rembrandt etchings in in scale. So like some things you have fold out, mm -hmm. 
and then some of them are just like you know floating in the middle of the page. And this thing, I, I, I just couldn't believe this, uh, the amount of information that Rembrandt could get in the painting, but it was uh, the, the little drawing, but it was like the, um, it was a goldsmith shop and he was like creating a little character and he was kind of being very tender and you could tell that he was, everything about it, you could tell he, the man was Jewish, you could tell, you could tell so much just from mm -hmm. just lines. And there was a little fire in the background and the, the way that he sort of cross-hatched it and everything. But the idea of sort of creating something in this environment and the environment of that, and I thought, you know, what if I took that environment and um, in, in this painting, I, I very, very, very purposely contrasted the um, uh, white of the body that was rather devoid of color with color that was very heavy around it to kind of create that kind of intense contrast. Um, and flatten that. And, fla and flatten it out. And you know, and, 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 you know, and people kept thinking I was thinking about Manet, but it's like, well, you never forget about Manet, but I wasn't really thinking about Manet as much in, you know, the image I used, the, the, maybe the photographer who uh, had, taken the original picture of the girl, um, her, she did have a string around her neck. I don't know what color it was, but I made it red. Um, maybe he was thinking about Manet, and then you sort of end up thinking about it by accident. Mm -hmm. Manet, it's a good thing to think about, Manet. Absolutely. Anyway, so these are, these are more recent paintings. I don't think you've seen these. Uh, this is a show that I had in London. I'm pretty crazy about this painting. It looks a lot better in person than in this PowerPoint, but it's just a whole lot of green, and it's a very large painting. Um, yes, that is a man, and those are sheep, um, and it's you know the kind of I was sort of like thinking of um, the foreground as this kind of almost like theater, like sort of almost like a the 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 you know the cut out theater mm -hmm. thing, kind of Silhouette, coming in the yeah. silhouetted, coming mm -hmm. up from the foreground. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that the, you know, the, the uh, guy just really appealed to me. I mean, there's been guys in paintings before, like they, you know, just sort of in the background, like this guy here, mm -hmm. um, walking, just the journeyman. These people just sort of, what I found interesting about the journeyman, they, they, they appear, he appears in a bunch of paintings is that he literally wandered into, he's, up, he's, he's up there. there. Also up the top, the mountain. Oh yeah, and then he's up the top too. There's somebody else. Um, but I also think that those two are boys. I don't know why, but I think so. And what I like about the journeyman is that he sort of wandered into my painting. <laughs> it was like kind of like he wandered in. Somebody, people always ask me like, when are you, when are you gonna paint a man? And I and I and my the only the best answer I've ever had because you know you don't want to be defensive like you know like well do I have to or like what's that about um, the best answer I ever came up with was when one inhabits my imagination and the and it's not so much about male it's about the particular nature of that character it's it's the the the, the female thing is sort of like already you know been cast and is moving along in its own way. And this male character, in various ways, is sort of coming up. You know, as like kind of a journeyman, and a and a this guy was like a picking, picking a route. Um, anyway, so th this painting is called Scarecrow. And where does that motif come from, Lisa? Which motif? It's just so odd that her right leg is touching his fanny, seen from behind. Him or her is her, I think. But it's occurred before, and you have repeatedly painted that very specific. The fanny? Well, we know that. It's just the touching of it. If you go back to the previous two or three, it's a occur, uh, yes, right there in that painting. The si it's, somebody sitting on her? Yeah. Well, the, the very similar motif. Well, I mean, the, you know, if something is fun to do, you got to do it twice. That's the, oh, you know, it's like, okay. you <laughs> just, for, just for the hell of it. Um, I've been obsessed with that sort of, I have this book, um, it's a book of details of the Garden of Earthly Delights. Mm -hmm. 
the Bosch painting. I actually have never seen the painting in person, I'm embarrassed to say. But um, I have this book and it's like, and there's this detail of these. So the thing that's amazing about that painting is all these people are eating something, which is this red, round orb. And sometimes the orb cracks open and there's more balls inside and more people, and everybody's on something. It's like this crazy, um, it's like a rave or something. Yeah. And um, so there's this madness going on. It seems like a lot of fun. I guess that's what Burning Man is like or something. <laughs> and, or what people are after when they go to Burning Man. So the one scene that I love is that there's some guy sticking, using his friend's asshole as a vase. He's got shoving flowers in this guy's butthole. Yeah. And I looked at that and I was like, I can't believe that he painted that. That's so funny. <laughs> and, and then, like, years later, I was at the, um, one of these Whitney Biennials, and Paul McCarthy had the ground floor when you walk into the left, and it was like some chocolate factory. And it was a lot of things coming out of butts or simulated things coming out of butts and chocolate and things like that. And there were these two blue stocking ladies walking around, being all offended by it, and saying, like, you know, this doesn't belong in a museum, and this is really offensive. And I said, excuse me, ladies, um, may I make a case for why this belongs in a museum? And they kind of probably didn't, I just kept talking, they probably walked away, but um, <laughs> I was, it, you know, I was thinking about how, I said, have you ever seen, you know, Bruegel or Bosch in the idea of the Carnivalesque? And, you know, there's high, you know, there's things people do, like, you know, they're praying, they're doing wonderful things. There's kings and wonderful things that should be depicted. And then there are artists who depict the other side of life, which is not, uh, you know, you don't necessarily find um, depicted. And, and I do love the, the, those depictions in art is, uh, of the low classes doing their crazy, uh, gassy things or whatever, you know, it's just like bad, they're wrong, yeah. you know, like yeah. it doesn't belong in art. Mm -hmm. As those ladies said, mm -hmm. this does not belong. And I said, but somehow it does. Mm -hmm. And there is, you know, where I find that interesting. Anyway, so years and years and years later, I finally said, you know, like, wait, you know, why don't you just try to paint it? So I actually hired a model and, <laughs> She's like, do I actually have to have the flowers stuck in my butt? And I was like, no. <laughs> well, I think I'll fake it. But anyway, so we, we joke and tell everybody, I still know this girl, like that we did make her put the flowers in her butt. But, you know, it's, um, this, this is just, you know, um, the idea of like, kind of like the body as a, um, uh, a foot, and like a rest, you know, it's like using somebody as a kind of a thing to, um, it's a sculpture. I mean, it's slightly abusive. Yeah, it's a little bit uh, sculptural. And then, like you know, the fish and the and the refuse. And I've been asked a lot about like what, why I keep painting the um, the rind of the watermelon. And um, it it just is something I saw in a Japanese print uh, in the hundred uh, hundred views of Edo. One of my favorite of the views of Edo um, is the view from the garbage and. The, there's a scene where there's pigs aft at looking at the Edo um, and it's, you know, all kinds of crap left over and there's a, there's a watermelon rind. So I suppose, like, in general, something that I'm talking about over and over again in different ways is some ways in which bringing the view from the garbage dump, which I guess is my brain, um, <laughs> and the experiences of other kinds of things like you know knowing about you know extreme beauty and you know pain and all these things that can kind of go on at the same time not to be dramatic but this is a good time to end this because now even though we started about an hour ago wait a minute Fung I'm saying something okay <laughs> um, I'm gonna stop because it doesn't really matter but we need to wrap it up since we started late and let people talk. Good but idea. this painting is the first thing I 
um, since you talk, you're doing a show on Sandy, um, this is the first painting I made in my studio after Sandy. And Sandy freaked everybody out. It freaked me the fuck out completely. Um, I just, you know, I felt so rudderless. And, you know, it's funny, I keep saying that my husband was good, good, much better than me because he just said, let's get something to eat. <laughs> He just kept saying, let's, let's go find something to eat. And I was like, who can eat? You know, it's like the world is coming to an end, you know, and I was just being the hysteric, you know, like, ah. He's like, let's, let's go find something to eat. And um, the, 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 the intensity of all of that, and then I, I had a friend who, like, died that week, and it, not from Sandy, from something else. It was just so much was going on. And, and you realize that it's all going on all at the same time anyway. You know, it's just like, even if we don't, like Sandy is happening somewhere else in the world. I mean, it's not happening to New York City, but it's just like really bad shit is happening all at the same time and beautiful things and all these things. And it's just like, I was in my studio and I just sort of, I don't know if this painting is you know, worth the description, but it, it basically was something that kind of just came rushing out of me in this uh, weird burnt head and this sort of like very wounded figure just sort of uh, you know, that sort of needed a little scarf, needed a little warming up. Um, just anyway, so I'm, I'm making a painting from that now, but it it was a very powerful thing to paint. I don't, you know, I, I felt very strongly about it when I made it. So that is a good place to um, stop because of your Sandy show. Because uh, I did lose some stuff in Sandy, but not, you know, it's like, you hear stories and you know, we were all pretty lucky because we're still here. Yep. So still okay. Here. But anyway, yeah. we'd like to ask you guys questions. You ask us questions. We'll, and the best question can come to dinner. Mm -hmm.